class we had a chance to graph the atomic radius versus the atomic number. We also had a chance to graph the ionization energy versus atomic number. What we found were trends, patterns we see in this graph. So if we arrange our periodic table according to the patterns or trends that we find, we would arrange our periodic table in the following way. So we have across a horizontal row then we have a particular trend that we see as we move across this row we see the atomic radius decreasing across this row once again it decreases once again and we notice that as it goes across one complete row then we have one complete cycle of a decreasing trend or in the case of ionization energy it would be an increasing trend but we do see this trend but we notice here though is that our periodic table does not look like this what we've forgotten is the vertical arrangement as well. So we have both a horizontal arrangement and a vertical arrangement. So besides this horizontal arrangement, we also want to line up those elements that have similar properties. Not the exact same properties, mind you, but similar properties. For example, I'll place helium here above neon, and then that's already above argon. And I also want to take these three and move these down so that I have helium, neon, argon, above krypton, and xenon. So what I'm doing is placing those elements with similar properties above each other in a vertical arrangement. The example here is that all of these gases are what we call non-reactive. They're non-reactive gases. So those similar properties are placed on top of each other. They're not the exact same properties, but they are similar. Another example here is copper above silver. These have similar properties. So we have similar properties on top of each other, giving us a vertical arrangement for our periodic table. So we're just shifting the elements to align the elements vertically. That's why we have these spaces in the periodic table. It's for a purpose, vertical arrangement. Now, we also have this piece of the periodic table, which is plucked out here and placed down below. The question is, why do we do that? Well, I could, according to my idea of placing things vertically, I could just slide this piece all the way across and fit this one in. That makes sense. Now I still have the vertical arrangement corresponding to similar properties. But the problem here is now I can't see what's over on this edge of the paper, so it gets too cumbersome. So instead of doing that, we simply pluck it out and put it down here, just so we can fit it on an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper. It's that simple. So general trends exist for the periodic table, both horizontally and vertically. The horizontal trends that we see here, we actually call periods. So if I move across the periodic table within a row, I'm moving across a particular period. Dmitry Mendeleev was the first to discover these patterns in the periodic table. There was no periodic table at that point. He just had a number of elements for which he had properties. He arranged them in cards and set them up both horizontally and vertically according to the properties they had similar and the trends that existed from one element to another element. And what he was able to do was predict two elements that were not in existence at that time. I believe there were just 62 elements at that time, and these two elements weren't in existence. So we predicted the discovery of these elements, and it did happen later on. And this brings us to a big idea, revisiting back to our unit title, Evolution of Thought. Here we see, once again, that science is always changing. This is the nature of science. So we put forth uh, as best explanation as we can given the evidence we have and this explanation allows us to make predictions as well and if those predictions hold true then we know our explanation is a pretty good explanation so here we have this idea of a periodic table and this periodic table though is subject to change even still it's going through changes as we talk as we discover new elements and place them on the periodic table So our table represents all the matter that we have in the universe in its simplest form. And it's a huge, huge resource for us. But it's not something we want to memorize. If you memorized this in middle school, I'm sorry, you didn't have to do that. We're going to give this table to you on any test or quiz. So you should become familiar with your periodic table. Know how to use it. Use it as a resource. I mentioned already the idea of periods as we move across the periodic table. So we have one, two, three, four, five, 
six, seven periods moving across the periodic table. And in addition, we also have groups. So those elements that act similar, that have similar properties, we have grouped them together. So we have these groups that we have in the periodic table. These are the vertical groupings. They're also known as families. So here is group one, also known as the alkali metals. Group two is known as the alkaline earth metals. Then we have the transition metals in between. We go to group three, doesn't have a special name, nor does group four or group five. Group six, for that matter, doesn't really have a special name. And then we have group seven, we call the halogens. And the last group here, group eight, are known as the noble gases. Now you'll notice that your periodic table has a different numbering system for these groups, and we'll talk more about that later and the, the use of that numbering system later on. This graphic might be a better one for you to look at to be familiar with the group's names. That's it. Love the periodic table.